Freshwater lakes and rivers cover about one-fifth of the world's surface and provide almost every living thing with water to survive. Temperature typically ranges from 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer and 35 to 45 degrees or lower in the winter. The longest river in the world is the Naya River that spans 4,132 miles. The second largest river is the Amazon River at 3,977 miles. And the largest freshwater lake in the world is Lake Superior at 31,700 square miles. Lake Superior is one of five massive lakes. Altogether, they are called the Great Lakes. So, in total, there are 165 major rivers and 117 million lakes, all supporting so many species of animals, it's crazy. I can't talk about all those lakes and rivers in the span of 10 minutes, so I'm going to mainly focus on the Amazon River since it's the greatest source of biodiversity in the world. I'll also be talking about the Alaskan region and its rivers since they are famous for their great salmon migration. And lastly, the Great Lakes, since it is home to well-known Niagara Falls and the largest lake in the world, Lake Superior. I do mention other lakes and rivers just because they show examples that cannot be provided by these lakes and rivers. Common animals found in the Amazon are the pink river dolphin, which are an endangered species in the Amazon because of pollution and various development projects, which restrict the river's natural flow. In addition, they are often struck by fishermen's boats or get entangled in their nets. The giant river otter is another endangered species commonly encountered in national parks in southern Peru. Here they feed on Amazon fish and crustaceans and can grow up to 3 feet in length. Tragically, habitat destruction and illegal hunting continue to threaten this beautiful species and their numbers continue to decrease. Is that a mermaid? Nope. That's an Amazonian manatee. And that's her baby. These manatees are the only species to stay in fresh water, whereas other species will typically be in the ocean or move from fresh to salt water. Here you can see the baby is being very nurtured by her mother and the mother's nipple is on its armpit. Isn't that so cute? <laughs> Another animal commonly found in the rivers of the Amazon are the green anacondas. They typically grow 15 to 16 feet long with a weight ranging anywhere between 60 to 150 pounds. It's a freaking huge snake. Just look at this monster. This is a caiman crocodile. They have dark, scaly skin and can grow up to 10 to 14 feet in length and sometimes exceed 800 pounds in weight. They are endangered due to habitat destruction. Here you can see he's trying to catch a little snack. It's an armadillo swimming for its life. I didn't know armadillos lived in the Amazon, but apparently they do. And that crocodile looks pretty hungry, so yeah. So it's pretty well known that piranhas live in the Amazon. Here's some footage of the little devils. They have that signature red belly and those razor sharp teeth that like to saw through their scavenged meal. And sometimes they will hunt for their meals as well. Humans, surprisingly, are not part of their diet. The keystone species of the Amazon River are its apex predators like the river dolphin or even the bull shark which can transition from marine water to freshwater systems. On the other hand, Alaska's rivers are only inhabited by fish and invertebrates. The most common fish found there are the hagfish, halibut, herring, lampreys, mackerel, salmon, and trout. The Alaskan River's keystone species are salmon. They support 137 species including humans, bears, and other big fish not just in the river but in the ocean as well since salmon can transition from marine to fresh water. The Great Lakes are also home to an array of fish similar to Alaska's as they both must endure the cold temperatures of the water located up north. 
The food web of each of these freshwater ecosystems are unique due to the extreme differences in geographic location. Here in the Amazon, you can see we have the producers, which are the seaweed, the secondary consumers like the turtle, the manatee, and the golden dorado. Then there are the tertiary consumers like the anaconda, the piranhas, the arapaima, and the river dolphin, and the bull shark. If sharks were taken out of the food web, there would be too many secondary consumers taking over the ecosystem. They would devastate the vegetation and eventually kill themselves off because they ate all the producers. Then even the tertiary consumers like the river dolphin would have to emigrate or die off because they have nowhere else to go. The Great Lakes are similar in structure, however the species are completely different. The green algae, the blue-green algae, and flagellates are the producers. Above them are an array of microscopic invertebrates which are eaten by larger invertebrates. Those are then eaten by the smaller fish like the herring, the bloater, and the yellow perch, while those guys are eaten by the bigger fish like the trout. At the very top is the sea lamprey, and they are the invasive species of the Great Lakes. If green algae disappeared, there would be a decrease in food source for the primary consumers. Once their population decreases, the secondary consumers like that yellow perch would decrease, thus impacting the tertiary consumers, making them fight for food. Lastly, the lamprey would be at the top and ultimately they would also be affected, which would be okay because they are invasive species and we don't need them. The Alaskan food web is similar to the Great Lakes in structure and species. The plants and phytoplankton are the primary producers, while the zooplankton eat them, insects and small fish and worms eat them, and they are eaten by the crawfish and small minnows, while they are eaten by the bass trout and salmon, and they are eaten by bears, birds, and us. You following? Okay. The flow of energy is the same in every food web. After each trophic level, only 10% of the energy will actually be passed on. As far as migration goes and its effects on the environment, salmon is a species that immigrates and emigrates from the ocean to the river every four years. This affects predators that eat it like bears and birds because they can only hunt them at a certain time of year and only for a certain amount of time. This also affects the abiotic factors like the water condition. Since there are so many fish traveling and they will ultimately spawn there, the water will be dirty with excretions, fish blood from being hunted, and salmon sperm and eggs from spawning. All three of these freshwater biomes are stunning and abundant in biodiversity. However, none are immune to the non-native species that infest its waters. An invasive species of the Amazon is the golden mussel from China. It feasts on the flora and fauna of the Amazon and since it is not native, it has no natural predators. This allows their population to skyrocket and devastate all vegetation. One of Brazil's top experts on the mussel, a 27-year-old doctoral student at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, believes that she may have another solution. She believes that she can map the mussel's genome and engineer a virus or a bio-bullet that could render the species infertile. Researcher Marcela Uliano da Silva says if we manage it, it would be economically huge and it would also protect biodiversity. She's hopeful she'll succeed, but it could take at least four years to carry out the plan. Some of Alaska's invasive species include the Atlantic salmon, European green crab, northern pikes, and the red-legged frog. Alaska has a 103-page Alaska Aquatic Nuisance Species Management Plan that I didn't feel like reading completely, but basically they will 1. Collaborate with regional, national, and international programs. 2. Prevent introduction of new invasive species to Alaskan waters. 3. Detect, monitor, contain, reduce, or eradicate populations of aquatic nuisance species with minimal environmental impact. Four, educate public to prevent new non-natives. Five, do research on invasives and identify them and their impact. And finally, number six, make laws to prevent and control invasives. The Great Lakes' main invasive species are the lampreys and zebra mussels that are harming the native species that live in the water by taking their resources like food and space. Sadly, invasive species of animals are not the only problem all freshwater biomes are facing. Many of them are now facing extreme amounts of devastating pollution.
This is the Ganges River that travels more than 1,569 miles through India and Bangladesh. It absorbs a billion gallons of trash a day. 75% of this is raw sewage and domestic waste. The rest comes from industrial runoff, mostly from tanneries that leak toxic substances. Even still, it's widely used for irrigation and in houses and buildings. Near Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, the Chitarium River is choked with garbage and waste, supporting 30 million people who rely on it for agriculture, domestic, and personal uses. The waste has devastated the ecosystem so badly that dead fish always dot the surface. As a result, many fishermen have given up their trade and instead harvest plastic waste from the surface to recycle. When was the last time you actually caught some decent fish in this river? <laughs> Nowadays, Herman and his 13-year-old son are after a different kind of catch. They're scavenging for rubbish. What kind of plastic are you looking for? Lake Karakai is a small lake in central Russia. It is often referred to as the most polluted site on Earth. Containing just one square mile of water, the lake formed a dumping ground for nuclear waste by the Soviet Union for around 12 years between 1934 and 1957. Apparently, high-level radioactive waste makes up almost the entire lake bed to a depth of around 3.4 meters. Some areas surrounding the lake have high radiation measurements of around... Actually, I don't know what that means but it's enough to give a lethal dose to a human in as little as 30 minutes. Lake Tai is located near Shanghai in China. It is the third largest freshwater lake in China and has been plagued by pollution in recent times due to rapid growth of surrounding regions. While details surrounding the pollution in the lake are sparse, there are thousands of factories on its shores which quite possibly all discharge industrial waste into its water. Major algal and cyanobacterial blooms have been experienced in the past. Despite the government's so-called efforts to reduce pollution levels, the problem doesn't seem to be improving. Lastly, one of the great African lakes, Lake Victoria, was named after Queen Victoria when it was first documented in 1858. It is the world's second largest freshwater lake and Africa's largest. It forms the border between three countries, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. This has made the pollution prevention difficult due to the fact that all three countries need to work together in order to effectively reduce pollution. The lake has long been polluted by raw sewage, fertilizers, and chemicals, as well as being a popular dumping ground for domestic and industrial waste. These pollutants these pollutants reduce the quality of water, which is relied on by millions of people living on the shores of the lake. Let's see those pearly whites. Look, I'm a piranha. They're in the Amazon. So never go away. So I guess I gotta stay.